No, I saw you check that that, that is. It's on. That's the. Yep. Thing I Microphone is on. Worry about the most. Right. Thanks uh, for doing this, Roger. It's a it's a pleasure to sit down with you. So let's start with who are your parents and what did they teach you? My father was uh, Callis K. Allen. He went by K. Allen. And my mother was Doris Brady Allen. And my father was born and raised in uh, Heber, Utah. My mother in South Jordan. My mother had hundred, more than a hundred, well over a hundred first cousins that lived very close to her. So big family, close family. Um, I learned a lot from my parents. Uh, both of them were very friendly people. I learned a lot about the value of friendship. They had their own friends, but they also had couples that they did things in common. They would go on trips a couple of times a year, and then any time we vacationed as a family, we would go with other people. We usually didn't go on our own, uh, but we would travel with other people, so friendship was was big. We had a boat and a camper, and and uh, would go to the lake often and, and, uh, or take trips across the country for that matter, but always with friends. I would say from my parents, both of them, I learned about, uh, about being reliable, being dependable. You do what you say you'll do. People can count on you. Uh, I would say I learned from both of them a good work ethic. Um, they were both hard workers. I, um, I would say something a little more covert that I learned that they didn't deliberately teach me. I grew up being very attuned to their relationship. And even though they were both very good people and very loving people and nurturing of us children, there was some tension in their relationship. And I think that uh, I was aware of that and I was sensitive of that as a second child and a pretty young, uh, I picked up on it and was attuned to it and so sometimes felt burdened, as a matter of fact, by it. Uh, and became aware of feelings and sensitive to feelings and sensitive to dynamics that were going on between people, which is eventually, I think, one of the reasons that I got into the field of psychology. Uh, I was interested in, in uh, I don't know, always attuned to those kind of dynamics. And so I did learn that sensitivity, I would say, from my parents. Probably some of it was predispositional, but I learned it also, I think, from my relationship with my parents. And it's been something that I've carried forward in my life. Lots of things I learned. My father was a kind of an, uh, 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 an entrepreneurial, a renaissance man. He did a lot. He, he uh, got a, a master's in psychology, but it that worked for the UEA, but then that became an avocation and he was a businessman. And uh, land development and banking started a number of banks, developed some big pieces of property in both Utah and Denver. Uh, he was in politics, he was Speaker of the House in the state of Utah. He, uh, he was president of the Mental Health Association in the state of Utah, and then again when we moved to Colorado, president of the Mental Health Association in Colorado, and a, a big personality, a charismatic personality, somebody that people were always really a, attracted to, uh, you know, just loved my father and loved my mother, but she was much, much, much quieter and even some tension in that. She wasn't excited about dressing up and going to all of these big, you know, shindigs that my father was involved in. So, you know, that was a little bit difficult, but, but a great legacy the two of them left to me and my siblings. My siblings and I are very close, four of us, a brother and two sisters, and to this day we're very close. But, you know, mother was always there for us. She was available when we came home and, you know, provided well uh, for our needs, was a real nurturer of us. Great answer, and really neat. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I had no idea of your yeah. father was had such a high profile. You know, he he owned the point of the mountain at one time. Oh, I think I heard you say that. He started the uh, Alpine Country Club and had big, big projects that he worked on through the years. But was you know pretty well known in politics, and so yeah, it was a it was a. 
I know, gave us a lot of pride, I would say, as a family. Um, you know, knowing that we were part of the Allen clan. That was satisfying. Please, oh, sorry. Uh, how has being a father changed you? Oh, I would say being a father has just changed me profoundly to the depths of my soul, I would say. I think for all of us, uh, for me, life is about, and the gospel is about relationships. And I think there are no more important relationships than our family relationships. And when we're young and we're single, we don't know how those are going to impact us. I remember it was a relief for me to go away to college because of what I talked about earlier, the, the I don't know, the stress that I felt, the burden that I felt, maybe related to my parents' relationship and some of the feelings and the dynamics that were going on. And I felt so free <laughs> when I got away from home. Um, that, you know, my first couple of years I was at the College of Eastern Utah in Price, not a big school, but it was a relief. And then, of course, getting married eventually, and then those relationships become important again, and they change us. And then raising a family, having children, and, you know, there's nothing as joyful as holding a little baby in your arms and nothing as joyful as a little child sitting at your side or sitting on your lap and reading them a story and then watching them as they grow up and as they grow older. Those are very, very tender moments. But I will also say that there's a lot of hardship that comes in those intimate relationships that we don't know about, again, when we're young, that we don't necessarily count on. But family life, you know, we, we worship, uh, we love, uh, we esteem and value so much family life within the gospel and as we ought to. But family life is not easy. You know, when, I, when we started having children, uh, I was still pretty young and maybe in many ways immature. And it was at a hard time in my life. I was a doctoral student at the University of Minnesota and going through hard times, working half time uh, to support the family and a lot of pressures from going to school full time and a lot on my plate. And those kids were so young at the time and I don't know that I always gave them my best again because of tensions and pressures that I felt and how many demands there were on me in my life. And then as our kids grow older and they struggle with their own problems, we feel it as parents. And we feel their joys with them and we rejoice with them in the successes and the good things in life, but we feel their sorrows and their pain. Um, again, I think family life is a laboratory. Uh, getting married, uh, it, it's how we learn to live the gospel of Jesus Christ in that marital relationship and in our family relationships. It's how we learn about love and about uh, non-judgment and about forgiveness and about being vulnerable and soft-hearted and about honesty, emotional honesty. There's so many, many important lessons um, that we need to learn in our growth and our development to become, I would say, more like the Savior, more like our Father in Heaven. And the most important place we learn those lessons is in those relationships that are most intimate in our family relationships within our marriages and within our uh, families and as we're raising kids. And again, so they're so enriching but they're also challenging and they're also difficult. And as our kids struggle, as my kids struggled at times, they brought up emotion in me. And it wasn't always an opportunity for me to look in the mirror and see you know, my own immaturity and ways in which I needed to continue to grow and develop. But again, I think that growth and that development happens within the context of our relationships and nothing more important than those family relationships. And by the way, those relationships continue to impact me profoundly today. You know, we spent November, we went and watched our daughter's kids while they took a little trip and then had our daughters come 
for Thanksgiving and then during December went and visited a couple of our daughters and then a daughter in January up in Seattle and our son in February in, in uh, South Carolina and then had our daughter just recently with us from, from uh, Arizona. But now instead of just a small nuclear family, there are 25 members of our family. And I still feel their joys and I also feel their pains and their sorrows and I you know, we live in a difficult world today, and COVID was tough. And, uh, and the politics of today are tough. And just the stresses and the tensions, and so that personality that I mentioned, that I have that tendency to be, I don't know, sensitive, maybe even overly sensitive in some ways, I feel that. Uh, and so uh, it's a blessing, and it's also sometimes challenging and difficult, those such important family relationships. But, uh, you know, um, we feel their joys, but we also feel their sorrows. And I guess it gives us a glimpse of how our Father in Heaven feels. But again, I think that's the path of growth, and that's the path of maturation, and that's how we learn to live the gospel. And so I hope I prioritize my family always, and I know there are times when, when you know, I feel the pressure and I think, oh my goodness, I, I need a little bit of space and a little bit of time, <laughs> um, you know, for ourselves and also to do some of the work that I want to do. But family is always the, the highest priority, those relationships. So it's changed me profoundly and continues to impact me. A wonderfully articulate answer. Can you tell the story of your professional life? Sure, I guess I have to go back a little bit. I, I went to the College of Eastern Utah, which was a great decision for me, I loved it. Um, could have gone somewhere else, University of Utah, BYU perhaps, I don't know, I didn't. But those were two great years, and, and uh, then I uh, went on a mission to Bolivia, came home, went to BYU, graduated, entered uh, the master's program in organizational behavior at BYU. And uh, just partway through that program, turn, took an internship, which was a wonderful opportunity with uh, Procter & Gamble down in Albany, Georgia. And it was a wonderful internship, a wonderful place, because it was one of the most innovative plants, in fact, within, uh, within Procter & Gamble. So I learned a ton about organizational theory and development. And, but during that time, had been accepted into a program at the University of Minnesota, a doctoral program. And so we moved, Judy and I, fairly newly married, moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where we lived for four years, and I, I got my uh, doctorate in psychology. And upon graduating, really didn't know which way I would go. There was a possibility of a, you know, psychology, student personnel, more of an academic route versus a, a clinical route, and I, I chose the clinical route, and we moved to Colorado and where my parents had moved, and eventually all of my siblings settled. Uh, and we started an institute called the Human Values Institute, and my father and I, and for him it was more of an avocation because he had all of these business interests going on, but he still loved psychology and he loved teaching and he was a natural at it. And so anyway, we started, we had the Human Development Institute from, you know, that was through the 80s. And during that time had a clinical practice and had a number of therapists also um, employed and working for the Institute. I think what was most gratifying about those days was uh, I started a program called Making Things Happen, which was an intensive, um, I don't know, transformative type uh, course in personal awareness, in self-development. And we, we used to offer that course monthly in Denver, every other month in Salt Lake, about four times a year in Idaho Falls, but also in uh, Los Angeles, Minneapolis, and Washington, D.C., so traveled a little bit around the country. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I, it was, uh, 
It was intense work. It was deep work. We really worked with people on, you know, past issues and baggage, and but particularly self-awareness and self-responsibility, and and uh, it was it was very gratifying work. I, in that work, I would say I really learned to love people and learn to believe in the goodness of people, even people that are different from us, have different values than us. You know, in that course, people opened up their hearts to each other, and it was hard to not care about them. Um, and, uh, and I also felt God's love very much during that time. I felt so much his presence in that work, even though it wasn't spiritual, it was spiritual work, even though it wasn't church work, I guess I would say, but I, I felt his love for me, and I know that that love sustained me because of the difficulty of much of that work, but I, I felt the love for my fellow brothers and, and, and sisters, and, uh, um, but I think after a time, I also grew weary. It was very hard emotionally for me every time I, <laughs> after a, a number of years of walking into that course, uh, it was a roller coaster. It was hard work, and uh, I kind of burned out. And one of the fellows that was co-teaching with me, Randy Hartman, a dear friend, who was also with me through those years, um, you know, he left to start actually the depression clinic at uh, Utah Valley Hospital in Provo, and and uh, so I continued to do it for a few more years, but I decided to make a transition into consulting because I had the background in consulting. And in fact, the very week I made that decision, I got a call from a company in Spokane, Washington. The president of the company offered me a job, and at first I didn't know. He said, hey, I'm looking for somebody in HR. I racked my brain, and finally I said, well, you know, Fred, I've been wanting to make a transition. And he said, well, I was hoping. <laughs> and and so um, I thought I was going into an HR position, and, and the HR manager uh, quit. And I don't know if it was related to me coming or not, it may have been, but he quit and Fred said, hey, I want you to be director of HR. And I said, I know nothing about HR, I don't want to be an HR director. And he said, no, I want you to do this. And I said, no, and he said, yes, and I said, no. And finally he prevailed. And I agreed, and it was such a good experience. It was a perfect transition into organization development consulting because I realized I don't have to be an expert in HR. I have a team of people that are experts. All I have to do is manage this team. There were 13 professionals, 13 people. And it was a wonderful opportunity for me to help them define a vision and a purpose and define our values together and really engage them and involve them in, in helping make decisions about, uh, 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 about the work that we would do as an HR department. So it was a wonderful transition and it didn't last very long. And Judy and I were moving our family from Spokane, Washington back to Colorado. And as we transitioned back to Colorado, I met a man by the name of Preston Pond and the, he had been in the organization development program, organization behavior program at BYU, also done an internship and took a job with Procter & Gamble in Southern Georgia. The two of us came together and we formed a company called the, uh, the Center for Organizational Design. And our vision was to create uh, collaborative organizations, to change the culture of organizations from top-down command and control to more collaborative, higher engagement, higher participation among employees. And so we began creating products and created a number of products from strategic planning to organizational assessment to organizational redesign to leadership training and development and implementation of teams and you know Preston brought his knowledge and resources and I brought my knowledge and resources and pretty soon we had created all of these products and materials and for that decade I mean I look at decades 70s were about education and the 80s were about HDI and then the 90s became about the Center for Organizational Design and we were able to get some contracts together and do that kind of work with organizations, helping them transition into more collaborative organizations. And then toward the end, in fact, in 1999, a fellow came along, he was a vice president of marketing for Profiles International, 
And he said, Roger, I've been looking for products because I want to start my own training company. How about if you guys provide the curriculum and I'll find the trainers and consultants and you train them and we'll send them out and let them you know, use the products that you've created. And so it was perfect. And, uh, and so we did. And, and over the next, uh, next 10 years, I would say we certified like 1,500 independent consultants and trainers uh, to use the products that we had developed, uh, the organization development products that we had developed, focused mostly on leadership and teams and how to create, again, collaborative workplaces. And uh, so then about 2010, continued to do that work, continued to do consulting more independently, more on my own, sometimes Preston and I together, but a lot of it independently. Um, but in 2010, I started coming back a little bit more to uh, my roots, I would say, psychology. And I wrote a book called The Hero's Choice, uh, leading from the inside out at that time. And I started a web page, and so I was doing both. I had one foot in both worlds. And then in 2015, Judy and I decided to go on a mission. And at first it was you know, her idea, and I said, no, I'm not ready. I still want to work. I've got more that I need to do. And she said, well, my parents are getting older and there's not a better time. And, you know, it was back and forth and back and forth and actually a lot of tension around that decision. And finally, one morning I was praying and I realized that the most important thing we could do right now is go on a mission. And so I think she was shocked the morning she came from home from teaching early morning seminary and said, I'm, I'm ready to go on a mission. And uh, we sold our house and we sold our cars and we gave most everything else away, all of our furniture and so many of our personal belongings except what would fit in, I guess, a small storage unit and three suit, uh, two suitcases each and we were on our way to New Delhi, India, which is not where we had, we had requested to go to Ghana, Africa. We ended up in New Delhi, India. Uh, but anyway, we came home from New Delhi, and I've since then done a little organization development work, but particularly tried to grow the personal development. I have a web page, my own web page, and do a blog post. And uh, since Mission have been creating online programs um, in personal development, I have a program on parenting, a program on marriage, program on happiness, conflict, deep listening, um, employee engagement and leadership and so both business topics as well as personal growth topics and I see that as my future until I die. <laughs> they will have to carry me out with my boots still on because <laughs> I don't see myself not doing that work. I really enjoy that work and uh, have a pretty good audience. I have like 60,000 students online right now uh, that are enrolled in my courses. And Udemy, the learning platform that I'm on, has made me an instructor partner, which is only like three-tenths of a percent of their instructor. instructor. So it's been a, it, it, that, that has been a journey, a good journey, and felt like a good way to bring some, I don't know, culmination, I guess, to my, to my career. And when I say culmination, it's, it, I'm not done yet. <laughs> I am not done yet. I'm still going. <laughs> that's that's wonderful. Um, could, in just a, maybe a quick sentence or two, could you talk about what the heroes is it called? The hero's choice. The hero's choice, leading from the inside out. It's a core. It's a it's a book about personal development. It's a man who starts his own company and then is fired by his board of directors a number of years in because they thought he was mismanaging it. And it sends him into a tailspin, and he feels sorry for himself, and he's bitter, and he's angry, and he's alienating his wife and his kids and his family and his former business partners until he starts to learn, until he's willing to look at himself instead of just blaming everybody else. And he, he meets up with a, a, a man who becomes his mentor, an older man living in the mountains who becomes his mentor. And he starts to learn lessons in self-awareness and self-responsibility and, and eventually becomes much more collaborative and uh, recognizes his part 
in what happens and owns up to it. And when he's able to own up to his part in what happening happened, his life changes and it opens up for him and his experience of life becomes entirely different. That's probably a longer explanation than you needed. But no, that, well, that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, please share your faith journey. Oh, my faith journey has not been a traditional, conventional journey. Um, I, I remember even back in high school, I had questions. And I had seminary teachers that would call my parents and say, you know, your son, your son is going to go off on the deep end and he's asking these questions and he's just this rabble rouser. And the, the truth is, I was not intending to be a rabble rouser or a doubter or a questioner, but that's just my brain. And, and you know, I have three siblings who are spontaneous believers. You know, have, have, they, they believe, and, and for me, I had questions. And some of those questions were more philosophical, and some of them were doctrinal, and some of them were cultural, but, but I had deep questions. And I continued to be faithful. I went on a mission. I loved my mission. Um, I continued to be faithful in the gospel and in the church, but I had these questions in the back of my mind. And I know to some extent what it's like to not feel like you belong. Because I, there were times, there have been times when I have felt like neither fish nor fowl. Like I've wondered, what is my place? I really want to belong here. But what is my place? Because I see things in some ways differently than other people. And uh, so it, it's not been an easy journey. The faith journey has not been easy. And as a matter of fact, early in our marriage, and I give thanks to Judy for not guilting me, but for su su her support. And there was an eight-year period of time when I was inactive in the church. And she took our kids to church every Sunday and was faithful. And again, did not make me feel bad about myself. But I came back, and I came back because I feel the Spirit. And I know the Spirit works in my life. And because I felt God's love. And because I knew that this is where I needed to be in the basic doctrines. And I, I believe. I have faith. But there have been things for me that have been difficult that I haven't been able to share or talk about with most people because I think most people really wouldn't understand. I've always, or not always, oftentimes had some dialogue going on with people from CES, you know, that bishops would send to me or I would, um, or I would voluntarily just to talk things through, just to have somebody that to talk things through. Um, but. But so my faith journey has been a little unconventional, but but you know the the feelings are deep, and the faith is deep, and the feeling of God's love, and my my faith is based upon the Savior, it's based on Christ, and it's based upon you know even what we studied in church today. Uh, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I think Jesus is saying you know there are all of these things that can feel heavy laden. But come to me, come to me, look at me, see me. My burden is easy. My, uh, I, I, I feel that. Uh, and so I've read a lot about the journey of faith from LDS authors, but also from non-LDS other Christian authors. And so that's been helpful to me to recognize these are different phases that I have gone through in my life and to realize that I've had to wrestle some big issues to the ground, but I think I've wrestled those issues to the ground and there's not a lot that could happen that would shake my faith. I mean, there are things that could happen that would maybe shake some people's faith. It wouldn't shake my faith. <laughs> I've turned over a lot of rocks and I've done a lot of study and, uh, and so what I'm grounded in, I'm pretty pretty deeply uh, grounded in, and so I have faith, and it's probably been a more difficult faith journey than a lot of people, but I, I have faith, and uh, I, I love the experience of feeling, feeling God working in my life every day. Not every day, I mean, but, 
but I, I know that God is present and loves me and cares about me and uh, works in my life. And you know, it was a worry. I, I, when I was called to uh, be a bishop, the first thing I had to say to the stake president that sat down with me is, do you know anything about my journey? And to my surprise, he said, yes, I do. <laughs> Um, and I don't know how we learned about it, but I said, you know, there was a time I was inactive. I just want to make sure you understand where I'm coming from before I accept this calling. And he said, I do understand where you're coming from, and I think that this is a calling from the Lord. And, uh, and you know, so it hasn't prevented me from, since those days I was inactive, from accepting callings and really wanting to magnify and fulfill those callings to the best of my ability to remember those roots that I came from and the importance of, of uh, doing what I say I will do and being committed and stepping up. And, and I think in this faith journey, more important than anything else to me, I'm one who believes in ministry. I believed in the home teaching program. I believe in the ministering program because, again, I think that's the gospel. I think the gospel has to do with how we show up for other people and how we love people and how we support people, uh, no matter their own journey, you know? It's about loving and supporting people. That's the essence of the gospel in my mind. So that's a little brief faith journey. Well, when the camera's off, I want to hear more. <laughs> want some specifics. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, please describe any significant forks in the road of your life. Oh, there have been so many forks in the road of my life, like all of our lives, I guess. But, you know, would I have ever guessed I would be where I am today? No. Um, even choosing to go to the College of Eastern Utah, you know, when I could have, who knows, gone to University of Utah, been a commuter student, gone maybe to BYU, I don't know. Um, but that was a fork in the road. And I cherished the experiences. And then going to Bolivia, and by the way, when, when I filled out my papers, I said, I want to go to Bolivia. <laughs> but that was a fork in the road, who knows? you know, how my life would have been different had I gone somewhere else. Uh, when I came home, when I met Judy and married Judy, and what a 47-year fork in the road that has been. <laughs> you know, that whole journey of raising our family and then the decision, instead of pursuing academia, I decided to pursue a clinical practice and uh, move back to Colorado and associate with my father. and. And, uh, and then the decision to shut down, essentially, I mean, tried to transfer the Human Development Institute to some other people, but to walk away from that and to start the Center for Organizational Design was a huge fork in the road. And I look back on all of these decisions, and uh, again, who knows, um, you know, where other decisions would have led me. But those were all important forks in the road. And I think important for forks in the road for me have to do with the faith journey also. Because I had a brother-in-law, and that brother-in-law and I are very close. We're, we're, we've been very good friends through the years. And he went through a phrase, faith crisis kind of like I did, but he never came back. And, uh, um, you know, I made a decision to come back when I faced that fork in the road. And I'm really glad that I did because of all of the experiences that I've had and how I feel. And, uh, but boy, just so many forks that have made a difference in. And, and I believe we take a fork and we can make that work for us too. It's not like there's one path. You know, I think what's important, no matter what fork we take, no matter which path we take, is that we're interested in learning and growing and developing and the process of maturation. And I have felt that so much in my life. I shared with Judy in some ways our um, mission in India was hard for me. It was hard partly because of the physical you know, that's where I learned about heart disease. I had heart disease and was in the hospital. But also, I tell her all the time, I felt like I, life, our mission experience was a mirror. 
And sometimes I would look into that mirror and I didn't always like what I saw. And, and, and yet that kind of honesty, I think, is necessary to keep growing and developing. And so no matter what fork we take, and no matter where we are in life, I think there's an opportunity to learn and to grow, to become more spiritually mature, but also more emotionally mature. And uh, that, I guess that's how I look at the forks in the road that I've taken. What is something you wish you had learned earlier in your life? I didn't ever have a mentor. My father has been my best mentor and my closest mentor. And, you know, he has been a mentor, I guess, I would say. Um, but, you know, even in the early days of practicing psychology, he wasn't a psychologist. He was off doing business things, even though we had started this institute together. I guess I look back on my career and I wish I had been more open to mentoring. I wish I had let people mentor me. Even when I was, a, even in college, to let, let find a professor, find somebody. Um, I don't know, I've had this independent streak in me all the time, and it's been good on the one hand, um, but I think about my days at, uh, in Procter and & Gamble, and the man that hired me, that brought me in, is, was really a, 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 an organization development and systems development theorist, and one of the most well-known. And I didn't really take advantage of his, op his mentoring. He was there, he was available, he would have loved to have me come into his office, and for some reason, I thought I had to do it on my own. And I think even at the University of Minnesota, instead of really finding or letting my uh, Alan Anderson, my advisor, mentor me. I think I felt like I had to do it on my own. And then what do I do? I start my own business. And yeah, my father is there and part of it. And he, but, and then when I started the Center for Organizational Design, it was me doing it on my own. It wasn't joining up with other professionals and other professionals that were more seasoned than me and more experienced than me. It was me just kind of out there, you know, slashing my way through the woods and figuring things out and, you know, some advantages of that, but is it trust? You know, I'm not sure, but I didn't let myself be mentored, and if there were a lesson for me in life as I look back on my life, I wish I had allowed myself to be more dependent on other people professionally and let them teach me and guide me more. That would be the big lesson. Gosh, that's a great answer. How do you want to be remembered? How do I want to be remembered? I guess I want to be remembered as somebody who had a loving heart and who cared about people. And I hope that my kids and my grandkids feel that way about me one day. Uh, that, you know, that they can think back on their grandpa. With fondness and know that he loved them, that I loved them. Um, with the people that I've worked with professionally, I, I, I guess that's what I would hope, that they would feel that, know that I have a loving heart, that I care about them. And even within an organizational setting, you know, my objective was collaboration. It was all about let's bring people together to work together. Um, in other words, again, the relationship is right at the heart of it, at the essence of it. Let's bring people together and help them work effectively together as a team. Nobody being better than anybody else, but everybody, nobody smarter than any, everybody. And let's uh, work together by, you know, caring for one another as we do whatever work we're engaged in. So I guess that's the legacy I would like to leave behind. Do you have any hobbies? Oh, I guess I do. I, I like the outdoors. 
you know, hobby. I, I, we bought this little trailer <laughs> when we couldn't go to Europe <laughs> a few years ago during coronavirus. But a hobby is to get out with Judy and to be in nature. I love to be in nature and to hike. And uh, a hobby is to run. I love to run. Um, and I, I like other outdoor sports also. I like skiing, for example. So there are a number of sports, but a lot of it involves, you know, when I'm really happy, and <laughs> it's when I'm using my body, playing. And I can have a blast playing with grandkids. Maybe that's a hobby. Although I have to tell you, my kids told me a few years ago, uh, we were at a family reunion and asking, okay, what are your parents' hobby? My kids said, my father's hobby is cleaning the garage and napping. And I hope I'm remembered for more than that. But I like to play, and so I like to chase and, uh, you know, run with grandkids. And I consider, I don't know that that's a hobby. That's not really a very skillful hobby. But anyway, I like to be playful. I like to play, and I like to run and ski and do things that are more active physically. Those are my hobbies. You do have a very clean garage. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my kids... Really? I must have a pretty boring life. <laughs> no man's a prop in his own land. <laughs> right. Um, all right, so we are to the, the lightning round. What's your favorite food? Um, favorite food, I, I, uh, I love a garden salad. I eat a big salad, a big bowl of salad every day. And I have always enjoyed fresh fruits and vegetables. So that's probably my favorite food. Favorite place? Favorite place, a lot of favorite places. I like being home, but we have a house in the mountains of Colorado, and that's the, maybe the hardest thing, one of the hardest things about leaving Colorado. It's a house in Tabernash, not far from Winter Park, kind of between Winter Park and, and uh, Granby, and I just loved to go up there and spend time. I used to do a lot of my writing there. And sometimes I'd go alone, and sometimes we'd go as a family. But I, I love that place, being at that mountain home. <clears throat> Favorite book or author? Oh, and that's, you know, I would say one of my favorite authors is a man by the name of Thich Nhat Hanh. He's a Jewish, a Jewish, a Vietnamese philosopher. And it's from him that I learned about meditation, for example. He's written a couple of books that I just read and reread. And they're simple books, nothing complex about them. The concept is very simple. One is called silence, and the other one is called peace is every step. And late at night when I can't sleep, if I get those books out, uh, I love to read them because, I don't know, the message for me is very, I don't know, it's a very peaceful, um, loving message. So Thich Nhat Hanh, I would say, is certainly one of my favorite authors. Favorite scripture? Oh, you know, it is so hard to come up with just one scripture, but I would say recently one of my favorite scriptures is, Be still and know that I am God. Another scripture is, How can you love God, if, uh, whom you have not seen, if you cannot love your fellow man whom you have seen. Those are a couple of scriptures I love. Favorite hymn? I would have to say favorite hymn is a poor wayfaring man of grief. That's everything. Okay. Oh my goodness, 350. Well, can, can you tell that he can do... 40 hour seminars. <laughs> he, uh, he is. He, he has a much harder time giving a five or ten minute talk than, you know, oh. <laughs> than, than a four or five hour. 
<laughs> Whatever. Uh, he's wonderfully articulate. Yeah, he is. Uh -huh. uh, well, thank now, you. I'm not talking a criticism, but anyway. Yeah. And I, this is my third piece of toilet paper. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to hear from her? Yes. No. Yes. No. Everything I had thought about to say, he said himself, so how can I say it? Uh, once you're in the hot seat, it'll all come to you. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh. No, you're hot. And I confess to Roger that I have, okay, so I had a speech, um, well, it was, I was in speech all my elementary school because I didn't slow down enough to enunciate. <laughs> and so they finally in sixth grade had me talk into a tape recorder and listen to myself. So then I slowed down, but I've never liked hearing the sound of my voice. So I told him, and he told me, he just told me, was it? Earlier this week. That I had to say something, and I said, no. <laughs> you know, I walked out of the room, I'm not doing it. And he goes, are you mad at me? What is this? I said, no, it's about me. I, I hate pictures of myself, I hate hearing myself. So I said, I never want to hear what I say. Well, we can uh, put a filter on your voice. <laughs> it can sound like... James Earl Jones. <laughs> uh, so, don't start recording until you tell me what you want me to say. I mean, what, what am I... It hasn't stopped recording. Oh. <laughs> but he'll edit it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I'll, I'll give you a... a, a here's what I'm going to ask you. Um, why were you initially attracted or to, to Roger? What initially uh, drew you to him? Uh, and what else should we know about him? And, I, and, and maybe if this is easier, one question that, that might be useful is, how is Roger um, misunderstood by people who don't know him as well as you do? I've never gone around asking people what they think of Roger. I don't even think about that. Um, hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Well, let's go back to um, what initially drew you to Roger. To Roger? So we were both at BYU. We were both seniors in psychology. And um, I was, when I first went to BYU, I was a math major and a physics minor. And, um, but the math department at that time at, at BYU was very theoretical. And so in the middle of my junior year, I switched. I just had had, I, I probably should have gone into computer science or something, math education, but I didn't. I said, the other thing I love is people. So I went into psychology and sociology. So we were both seniors. He was to graduate in June and I needed to stay till August. And I was in student government and we had a mutual friend in student government. And, um, and so he, uh, he was looking at my schedule and he said, oh, a good friend of mine is in your experimental psychology class. I said, who's that? He said, Roger Allen, he's really smart. I thought, how smart's really smart. So, um, Smart enough to date you. <laughs> <laughs> so one Saturday, um, I met a group of kids that we studied in the library and he was there with them because I guess we had more than one mutual friend and afterwards we we talked and um, so anyways we started dating that last semester and and um, 
yeah, it was pretty fast. Um, and I ended up not staying and graduating in August um, when the bishop found out we were engaged and how we'd only known each other a number of a few months that maybe it would be better for me to continue getting to know him. <laughs> so um, I went to Denver with him for about a month and a half and had my own apartment and got a little job and anyways. Um, my parents met Roger a few days before we got married and my dad said, well, you're the one that has to live with him. I'm sure if you want to live with him, I can put up with him a few <laughs> days a year or whatever because my parents were out on the East Coast. So anyways, um, yeah, and, and I would say that Roger and I have a complementary relationship. We're much better working together than either one of us separate, but we, in some ways, we have a lot of common interests, history, outdoors, hiking, camping, all that kind of stuff. Um, our values are very similar, um, but emotionally, we balance each other out. Um, so, anyways, um, yeah, so what, Roger is the greatest teacher I've had in my life. I have learned so much from him. Um, and I've become a much better person in the 47 and a half years we've been married. Um, and what? What else would I say? But I think people can see his good heart. Um, but he challenges me to, well, I mean, to me, life is about growth and development. Um, that's why we're down here. Service, um, but growth and development loving, supporting people in all their goodness. Um, we've had very different upbringings. He's a Utah kid, and I only have lived in Utah the last few years here and at BYU, and I was out in the, out in the mission field. And so not a lot of Mormon friends. Um, so very, just very different experiences, and, uh, but he's a very good man. What else should we know about Roger? I just told you that. <laughs> one answer went right into the next one. <laughs> I don't, I mean, you know, he's, yeah. He lays his, his heart out there. And uh, he truly loves people. He truly, truly loves people. He's not perfect. Okay. About that. <laughs> That's the big secret. I've, I've told him for years, you can be perfect as soon as you can because then my imperfections will no longer bother you. <laughs> so, anyways. Um, Judy, thanks for, for sitting down. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't been the greatest teacher.